thank you everyone uh, i think after very stimulating five panels we've come to the final uh, panel of the symposium i'm not going to take too long i know uh, we have um, we have four real interesting speakers talking today and i'm going to uh, just introduce myself and the speakers and let's let's get things rolling very fast I'm based in Colombo in Sri Lanka so I write in an independent capacity and I'm I also work uh, at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art Sri Lanka so as a writer personally um I've known some of the panelists today I've been friends with them I've interacted with them although always virtually um but um it's so great to know that we we all we all uh, have been experimenting we've been working doing very interesting things uh, with text so this panel is called text in the expanded field so i'll briefly introduce the uh, four speakers arushi vats is she's based in new delhi india she's trained in critical theory and art history her writing engages with practices in visual and lens based art and present long form explorations that analyze impulses and currents stirring beneath the surface her writing has appeared in various local and international journals she has also authored several curatorial notes and short stories basic klana is a visual artist and an academic researcher from mizoram and based in new delhi india um he defines himself as a socially conscious eccentric owning a conscious refusal of a centrally defined axis as well as an unconventionality to his practice um an independent writer and performer najreen islam is based in new delhi um she has been associated with several platforms as a writer um najreen's research interest is situated in the tech in the intersection of moving image histories archival politics and institutional omissions Sanjuti Mukherjee is the editor for ASAP or Alternative South Asia Photography a platform publishing pedagogical conversations on the political and cultural aspects of photography and film Sanjuti is unfortunately unable to be here with us today in person uh, due to an emergency related to her health um, and representing ASAP with us today we have Malika Viswanathan who works as part of the editorial team at ASAP Malika is also an independent filmmaker, writer and researcher focusing on lens-based practices including film and photography. I think what is so interesting about all four of our speakers is the manner in which they use text in their various practices in and around art. They blur the boundaries around art writing and, and encompass new discursive forms that include artistic research, performance, curatorial pro propositions, and speculative criticism. They do not subscribe to conventional forms or ideas of art criticism that perhaps assume a pos position of authority, but they rather focus on innovative ways in which text can occupy conversations around art. More than anything, I think the four speakers today embrace um, developments in around technology and digi digital spaces, giving new meaning to writing, reading, and circulation, um, and the genres and different modes of ad address that have that that have been born due to uh, developments in technology. So the speakers will talk about their different urgencies on this topic. and you will realize they have they have various uh, forms of talking about these urgencies as well some will be manifestos some will be conventional pre uh, slide show presentations but also they will also, they will talk about their work in a very engaging manner so the panel will have short 10 minute presentations by each speaker and then we will move on to a conversation and q and a session with everyone we will also take questions from the audience so if you have any questions please leave them in the q and a box thank you um i also want to specially comment on the uh, on how resilient our speakers have been today um despite um different emergencies that have occurred they are here and their platforms are represented i particularly want to thank everyone for that so i'll first 
uh, I think, invite Arushi to speak. Thank you, Pramoda, for that generous introduction. Um, and thank you to India Art Fair, Ishara Art Foundation, and Shivnada University for organizing this symposium. I would like to take this opportunity to discuss not specific works or projects I've worked on, most of which are available in the public domain, but to use this as a space for stock taking and introspection. If writing on the arts is to be more than midwifery in the birthing of meanings, what is the role of the art writer? I share with you today what writing has been and can be for me and for us. My presentation is in the form of a five point manifesto titled Drops of Sun. I've shared a link to a Google doc draft uh, in the chat box with, from which I'll be reading out. Uh, I've always found transcripts useful in following a presentation. So you could click on the link uh, if you feel the need. I'd be narrating that transcript. Drops of Sun, a manifesto. All beginnings are detours, bear with mine. Somewhere Umberto Eco wrote, each sentence contains a universe. So I begin each year by sticking a sentence up on the wall that lines my desk. These sentences have formed a strange catalog of dwellings and preoccupations that agitate and innovate my writing. In 2019, it was a lyric borrowed from a painted banner in Shaheen Bagh, which invoked breath. Kya zulmato ke dor mein bhi geet gaye jayenge? Ha zulmato ke dor ke hi geet gaye jayenge. In the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. In 2020, in the throes of a virulent siege that swiftly dissolved any lingering myths about separateness of human life from planetary destinies, while unspooling the delicate threads that uphold, actually, the urban farce of success as mastery or triumph, of will as capital, it was the concluding line of a devastating chapter from Garth Greenwell's novel, Cleanness, which read, I composed as best I could my human face. I repeated the sentence to myself as the gaps between deep emotional anguish and turgid professionalism grew narrow and intermittent collective crises were straddled with Zoom meetings and calendar invites. Today too, I join you with this human face and human voice. This year, the sentence on my wall is Aimee Cezaire's We've Been Branded by Cartesian Philosophy. I encountered the sentence innocently, mid snacking in the essay book Discourse on Colonialism, and it hit me as a gust of unseasonal wind, ruffling pages, knocking objects over, laying waste to the prevailing order of things. Suddenly, familiar ideas were asunder. I was alert to the invisible supposition structuring my thoughts and opinions. The sentence continues to grip me. And I begin by sharing this with you, for it presents to me certain tasks I must undertake. These tasks I list in the form of a manifesto, a garland of talismans, or a series of prescriptions to the self that reveal to me possibilities that bloom within acts of writing, which are necessarily acts of being. Being in all its glorious impurities, states of contact, compromise, immersion, contamination and confluence, being as a tidal force, cosmically directed, yet assertive in its environs, nourishing and amending with the same sweep. Here are, in no order whatsoever, injunctions to myself as a writer. Number one, light opacities. To illuminate persistently the sedimentation of normative tendencies and beliefs in oneself, to investigate how these may flow into sentences that form on the page, to fade every layer that conceals the scaffolding of privilege and prejudice, and to excavate traces of pasts that are forgotten, to understand that much may be learned in astute listening and observing of non-anthropic ways of being in the world, Anna Singh writes that the winds of the Anthropocene carry ghosts, the vestiges and signs of past ways of life still charged in the present, through writing to convene with spirits and gods. 
to become a prism that absorbs the given and the present, and in turn, through the transmogrifying force of refraction, summons the otherworldly, the unwieldy, the impossible. Number two, epistemic sovereignty. To refuse all frameworks that contravene the wisdom that we must be drops of sun under the earth, as Fanon describes blackness, and which I extend to the colored body that holds cosmic effluvia as, and is in total effusion with the world. To reject mastery, the violence of control, to float amidst the provisional, the revisional, the unknowing and understanding together. To follow Astrida Neman's dictum, which implores us to figure selves as blood and water or bodies of water, not only rejects a human separation from nature out there, it also talks many of our accepted cartographies of space, time, and species, and implicates a specifically watery movement of difference and repetition. To see all bodies, sites, matter as porous with the capacity to leak, to discharge, to get slippery and wet in the lexicon of Tiflisia. To permit oneself through the acts of writing, moments of submergence and surfacing. To be drenched in the opera of deep time. To ask oneself with each stanza, each sentence, as Robert McFarlane does, are we being responsible ancestors? Number three, deltaic imagination. To deploy narrative as a blade that can rip the limits of the archive that can rest with what the archive fails to generate. Or as Sidiya Hartman asks in Venus in Two Acts, how might it be possible to generate a different set of descriptions from the archive, to imagine what could have been? And further, to use critical fabulation as a practice to jeopardize the status of the event, to displace the received or authorized account, to write with and against the archive to stir methodologies into potent spirits, to drink from the cups of historiography and narratology, from literary analysis and critical studies, from biographies and inherited stories, from oral and choral epistemes, from folklore and embodied almanacs, from biotic abiotic assemblages. Four, lyrical valencies. To ask, why not music? Why not poetry as a register for lived witnessing, for quotidian equity? The lyrical tradition of poetry and song honors the elemental composition of the body, the mingling of breath, air, and energy to produce distinct sounds and inflect live meanings. As Yogesh Metra writes, melody is constructed through historical fact, and music is a medium to pursue a life of the mind emancipating singers and listeners from social constructs. So why not metaphor, anecdote, recitation? Why not laughter? Why not joyous militancy at friendship fraternity? Why not anger and rage at injustice? To be tempered or to disrupt with equal care? To permit one's heart and pen both? Just as Naomi Shihab Nye laments, where can the crying heart craze? Just as she believes, not everything is lost. Five, inventing elsewhere. To remember, in the words of Paul Preciado, that liberty is a tunnel that must be dug by hands. Freedom is a way out. To report and respond to such acts of digging underway all around us. To join with the very hands that write the efforts of making such tunnels. To foster in the vein of Gramsci pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. To recount Preciado's inventory. By freedom, we mean the ability to go out. To perceive a horizon, to build a project, to experience, if only for a fleeting instance, the radical community of all life, all energy, all matter beyond the taxonomic hierarchies invented by human history. To write as taking a step towards this freedom. To thank you, dear listener, for bringing yourself, your histories and futures, songs and dreams into this moment that we inhabit together. 
to never erase you or silence you or forget that you're here. I dedicate to you an epithet Carl Sagan wrote for his wife, Annie. In the vastness of space and the immensity of time, it is my joy to share a planet and an epoch with you. And this is why I write. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arushri. I think as always, I am so moved by how poetic your words are. Um, I am now going to hand over to Tlana. Thank you, Pramoda, and also to Sabi, uh, the Isara Art Foundation, India Art Fair, and Sivnadar University for having me uh, in this symposium. So um, I might not be as poetic as Arusi. <laughs> Um, I will be sp briefly speaking about how I approach writing and my processes, which takes many different forms and styles, uh, informed by my own artistic practices and academic research, my multi locations and positions, uh, so on and so forth. A lot of this has to do with the fact that I identify myself as a multidisciplinary practitioner that is interested in a variety of questions. Writing came about in my practice for a need to articulate and formulate my thought processes in my practice. But uh, rather than being merely a means for articulation and mediation and render them legible, they've become so much more in ways that uh, they become a part of the work or the work in itself. This comes about as forms of small publications in the form of zines, artist books and blog posts. Uh, many of my works is informed by research and writing and they often become part of an exhibition as well. And especially when it comes to my artistic practice, the borderline between writing or text and visual is blurred as I do employ text, not as text in a traditional sense, but as object or as signs and symbols. I guess one of the driving factors to this exploration is the fact that I do write in my native language, apart from writing in English, which is Mijo, the Latin script, you know, the alphabet that we are using now is developed by the Christian missionaries during the late 1800s. Uh, colonial expansion in Mizoram and other northeast states uh, is mostly experienced as the advent of Christianity, uh, with it, the introduction of education and medicine, and also uh, art as we uh, came to define it now. This became a sophisticated marker of modernity. Um, a more interesting take on this is the writing system that is highly incompatible with the Mizo language in terms of grammar and tonal variation. So in a way, I actively try to bring in this writing system as a post-colonial inquiry and help question about systems that are rigid where one is consumed to complacency. On the one hand, uh, well, incompat incompatibility is frustratingly a problem around translation it also turns out to be uh, quite fruitful in so many ways when one is not uh, nearly reduced to its shortcomings. Writing about or writing as my own creative practice, of course, branches out to other forms of writing. My research primarily focuses on art and artists from Northeast. Um, here, my positioning is critical to questions around representation not so much as a burden due to the lack of discourses in infrastructures and institutions, fundings, et cetera, in the region. I am deeply interested in the uh, Polysimus notion of abstraction to argue for the multiplicities and complexities when one assume or repudiate this collective identity that is the notice. I am not merely interested in the ontological and long debated philosophical abstraction, or the notion that abstraction in cognitive psychology as a capacity for abstract thinking that lends itself to the highest level of intellectual operation as opposed to the notion of the particular that stands for an inability to grasp things in its totality, uh, but more to question abstraction as the often witnessed willful ignorance and misrepresentation that has led to a series of conjectures and stereotypes which ended up creating a notion of the other. So um, necessarily in writing about the Northeast, its context and uh, different positionings, it is important to assume as a writer, uh, the position of a cultural insider, though the question, uh, through the question of uh, 
agency as an implied abstraction, acknowledging the long history of being subject of an ethnographic gaze, uh, but also to assume different other vantage points. Again, uh, this is a mode of abstraction, which is very crucial in my engagement of writing. Um, this has been uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, with scarcity of literature. Uh, how does one engage with text on the region so that it doesn't posit itself as a sole agent or being authoritative? On the one hand, the urgency I find myself, as Lucy Lippert in her article Mapping puts it, is that most of the artists from the subaltern are brainwashed by the notion that art speaks for itself and have been silenced, uh, abdicating responsibility, doing little to resist the decontextualization of their works and thus themselves. This is perhaps my constant reminder to engage in writing practices to arch for discourses and expand context and processes of uh, art making. Not so much to an engagement towards um, decontextualization or recontextualization, but also to understand ways in which they open up new possibilities of engagement in discourses, or perhaps an instantiation to understand our conditionings and uh, new modes of knowledge production. On the other hand, it is also notoriously difficult not to dwell on a certain lack. There is an urgency for documentation and creating uh, repositories for active discursive engagements that are accessible. Uh, both in language and platforms in which these texts are published. Short writings as a form of social media posts, uh, stories and blog uh, publications has been a handy platform in these situations. And um, on that note, I am extremely excited about many of the new initiatives that are born out from the region that share the same urgencies. Um, examples like the Northeast Art Initiatives, uh, notice like books, GAP, to name a few that are actively engaging with talks, publications, and other modes of engagements. And I'm also very pleased to be a part of these uh, engagements in some of uh, their initiatives in the past, and many more such interesting endeavors are brewing in the near future as well. So um, since this talk is structured around text in the expanded field, um, I can't help but think about the multiplicities in which the definitions and practices of art and writing becomes blurred and constantly redefined. What is interesting, at least for me, in my engagement towards the Northeast is in the question of representation as a perennially relevant topic that confronts with difficult and challenging question on how to best make a case for the field studied. Instead of relying on generalizing categories and existing nomenclatures, Writing in the expanded field has allowed for the possibilities of engagement with uh, individual subjectivities that extricates one from that very burden. It is also crucial such that it resists essentialization and the burden of how best to make a racial or ethnic political stand. Um, perhaps one is also freed from the burden and politics of translation and writing in vernacular language that detests such uh, rigid categories. Uh, I'll just give just one example. Uh, in the Mizo culture, it is notoriously difficult to substitute the word art and what it entails, what it includes and exclude. What about the existing terminologies and classifications that is not compatible with certain cultural art practices? Although many cultures uh, from the Northeast has a long history of art making in the form of sculptures or painting in the traditional sense, uh, many of the art practices as we came to know came about only as a product of modernity in many other cultures. Uh, movements of indigeneity and an imposition for a need to construct traditional art or one that reflects a certain ethnicity and identity uh, which many artists are uh, faced with a dilemma um, proves to be uh, counterproductive to the notion from which they stem. Thus abstraction for me is a way to assume different identities and positions. And the text or writing in the expanded field has opened up possibilities for a new relational mode. And especially to engage with practitioners who have moved away from this rather constricting terminologies and its um, associated art practices. As I mentioned earlier, I take many different positions and forms in my writing, um, I'll just move on to talk about one such writing, uh, 
which is writing anonymously. Although I won't be sharing much in details, uh, what I have written as that would go against the very idea of anonymity. Um, well, anonymity can be associated with many things like uh, freedom or perhaps uh, cowardliness. It is also important to acknowledge how it can create spaces for complicity. complicity. In the history of literature and publishing, uh, writing anonymously or under pseudonyms are often employed uh, to render the works visible and gain readership and legitimacy, um, which in turn avoids uh, prejudice. And in the context of my writing anonymously, um, as Arusi Epsley puts it in our conversations leading to this, uh, it comes from a space where one becomes, you know, one, one is a fugitive especially with the current narrative of the ruling party where uh, dominant religion is postulated as being fundamental to Indian as the country splits, where violence and detestation, of, uh, detestation against those who do not wish to comply with the dominant narrative is on the rise, the split half becomes the fugitive. With an impending fear under constant vigilantism, anonymity renders one visible and invisible at the same time thereby disidentifying individual identities. Otherwise, social and caste or class position came on the front line of, uh, on the front line of the polemic and silence becomes preferable over words and in individual identities become uh, more important than the text themselves. So I'll end there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Tiana. I think lots of things for us to unpack. Um, in the Q&A. Um, the next uh, presentation is by Najreen. Um, unfortunately, she's not feeling so well. She has asked me to read her presentation on her behalf. And these are her words. Najreen, you... Um, Um, Najreen, do you mind uh, going into presentation mode? It's okay, I'll start reading. Um, as a writer, I engage not only in independent criticism and reflection, but also commissioned writing for artists and galleries. Oscillating between institutional mandates and subjective reflection, I function from a space of speculation as I attempt to delineate the devices through which we view, understand, or look at art. It is important to mention here that a lot of my writing is informed by my performance practice and the malleable language of the body that it entails. As the fulcrum to my understanding of the world, I find that the body rejects any rigidity of thought and even encourages a radical dissolution into molecules if needed. It is a constant process of building and rebuilding and sets no expectations with regard to lineage. My writing takes trajectories in tandem with this impulse. This impulse further ties up with my long-standing interest in the archive and a keen interest in how archive could function as a medium of mobilization for the performative body. Informed by interdisciplinary intersections, my research interest includes in its purview the ontology of the image, image histories, archival politics, and institutional omissions. I'm drawn towards the performative potential of the image as it manifests through the slippage between fact and fiction. This gap between fact and fiction is what interests me. The, that interstitial space of illegibility, illegibility that takes away the archive status as, a, as absolute objective truth. In 2019, I conducted research on performance archives with the help of the Art Writers Award conferred by Take on Art Magazine and Swiss Arts Pro Helvetia, which led me to think about how the document no longer remains a stable item of value that's preserved and studied, 
but is actively transcribed onto other media, including the performative. This leads one to think about how the document can be used as what Diana Taylor calls a repertoire that is invisible, that is invisible imprints and trails that endure through memory, a system of visual and oral science. Performance allows history, memory, and interpretation to be in constant flux, allowing space for the generation of new kinds of uh, significations constantly. As part of my research recorded in this monograph, I focused on performance pieces that use documentary materials from an event in history, which in turn became an experiential record of the concerned history that then comfortably cohabited with public memory as a mode of transmission. In continuation of my interest in the mobilization of archives, as well as my own performance practice, I crafted a performance piece earlier this year titled, What's in a Name? under the aegis of Reframe Institute of Art and Expression. Combining personal experience and narrative fiction, the performance, which was recorded on video and disseminated through an online showcase, revolves around the protagonist's Muslim identity and the delicate complications arising from the dual need to preserve and assimilate. A little summary of the piece. The assimilation by non-normative or minoritized bodies causes very specific erasures of faith because survival and invisibility go hand in hand. In the search for an anchor, I looked at the people around me, the space I was then inhabiting, my parents' home in Kolkata. The spaces, the objects that surrounded me or that I grew up with and the memories preserved away in old-fashioned albums as fodder for the script. Written as, as a monologue, it deals with the protagonist's entrenched fear of hellfire on having deviated from normative expectations as a Muslim woman. Through meandering trajectories of thought, the character arrives at an understanding of her person and the choices she has exercised. While a series of childhood memories parallel to the fear of hell permeates the frames, Using the room the writer has spent most of the pandemic period in as staging ground for the protagonist's reflections, the, pre the piece explores her attempting to navigate dom dominant spaces that are not designed to accommodate her. In a conscious departure from representations of Muslim women that conform to or border on the, on the stereotype, this story centered on the character in all her inconsistencies, dilemmas, rage, and failures as one's taking a claim to space. Making use of the literary form of the monologue, the script follows accounts of discrimination, humor, and idiosyncrasies as they exist in the fringe realm of rumor, gossip, whispers, and informal circles of expression. It is where the bigger complications of imprisonment, citizenship debates, and threat of annihilation issue in the history, memory, and agency of the singular knowing body that generates and stores information for recall, retrieval, and reenactment. Using this premise of the sentient body, the performance video explores the archival impulse of personal memories as they congeal in the form of an informal address. Here is a small uh, expert from the script. Do you see this portrait? They are my parents from the time they were married. They look so young and handsome, yet quite stoic, don't you think? Like our parents do in, our, in old studio photographs, it's actually an enlarged version of an original. It was small and black and white, so it was colorized when it was enlarged as well, which reminds me, the colorist in the studio had made an assumption. He took the liberty of placing a dash of red in my mother's hair parting, which was absent in the original. Mother was quite amused at the vermilion. And the error is now a story for laughs. In this section, I made use of, uh, continuing the presentation. In this section, I made use of said portrait that has always hung on the living room of a house in Kolkata, bearing a queer history that was only occasionally joke, joked about to comment on casual instance of erasure. The whole performance makes use of micro histories to attempt to visibilize a set of experiences that simmer right underneath mainstream narratives about invisibilization. Invisibilization, sorry. 
I look at it as an attempt to record a moment of historical change through one woman's lens. How private spaces of negotiation altered with changes brought on by institutional authority. In other words, it's an attempt to create an experiential record and an access point to a contemporary narrative of Muslim identity that does not essentialize. The script is also a conscious departure from representations of Muslim women in media that, con that, confirm, that conform to or border on, this, on the stereotype. The individual assertions get subsumed into larger narratives and the women's stories are passed over in their use only as entry points. I extend this impulse to archive the margin in my writing on cinema and photography as well. I consciously choose to write on artists or work that tell stories otherwise omitted in convenient retellings by the institution. I have interviewed and spoken with artists such as Moni Sahamad Shah, Bunu Dungana, Nida Mehboob and others whose work interrogates illegible histories, archival possibilities and where the image is politically mobilized across contemporaneous, contemporaneous contexts. In the process, the image has emerged as fertile ground to not only reimagine its analog histories, but also navigate its position in the digital infrastructures of surveillance and informal economies of public dispersion. I have pursued this impulse in the capacity of a writer for alternative South Asia photography or ASAP art, an editorially driven mobile application and website that covers lens-based practices across South Asia. Another of my definitive experiences with regard to art writing has been the 5 million incidents project organized by the Goethe Institute and Max Müller Bauer and curated by Rax Media Collective. Designed as a year long series of events on the premises, the varying timelines of their manifestation and the density of the occupation, documenting an undertaking of the magnitude of 5 million incidents was unnerving at first. While some projects took months to gain momentum, direction, or clarity, others assumed short-term records and resolutions. I had to mold my body and attention accordingly, speaking with the actors at the pace of their projects, often revisiting them, them at a later stage to gain insight into their processes. My reflections went up on a blog titled Plural Futures. I cannot remember a beginning, a middle or an end to my participation in the reportage. It is actually less reportage and more reflection on the projects and, the, and their many entanglements across thematic and temporal registers. I have been a passive observer, an active participant, moderate as well as audience to the incidents. In active departure from prescribing the intent of the projects, I reflect on them in the capacity of an eavesdropper a witness in belated relay. I do not summarize the projects in detail or intend to dictate uh, to the uh, in, uh, intend to dictate to the reader on how to approach them. Instead, I present in the text the connections that I made, often in retrospect and mostly in tangent to the conversations I engaged with as the architectonics of the premise of the premises shrank and expanded in accordance with each speculative vision proposed and realized. My reflections are not just my own. They are informed by active congregations that took place in sites that evolved as fertile ground for collective fermentation around questions, questions of existence, horizons, language, networks, nooks, and allied points of immersion. I build the text on a scaffold of references and triggers collected and cultivated from these durational settings. My reflections come from having absorbed and participated in exchanges and overhearing others while not fully comprehending what was meant every time. I made peace with this lack of absolute clarity and carried this conclusion into my text. When 5 million incidents moved to the digital platform in 2020 owing to the nationwide lockdown, the nature of the project shifted as the algorithm became a major point of experimentation in departure from the tangible imaginations that never manifested. Zoom conferences, YouTube Live, IGTV dispatches, and podcasts on SoundCloud emerged as the primary, primary means of dissemination and communication. Geographic interiorities in the digital, such as chores and living rooms, reformulated the idea of space, 
tapping on the new pockets of interaction enabled by this shift. Documenting and reflecting on this swift passage of incidents called for a different order of attunement as my physical body dissipated into fluid habitats across windows and pads. This is where I engaged with artists working in the digital realm, ranging from artificial intelligence and biometric surveillance to application-based flannery, many of whom have already spoken as part of this symposium. Through my writing, I attempted to address the general impulse towards the digital territory and the involving symbiosis of the field, of fields between poetry and coding, architecture and gaming, etc. I consequently drove into these emerging and emergent vocabularies of the mediatic and the spectral. I offered then not only my thoughts and opinions, but also my misunderstandings and inquiries in tandem with how space and time were occupied processed and provoked by plural bodies for over a year. Each of these cases enumerated here is, a sim is symptomatic of large interest geared towards representing in text that which remains dormant in the crevices. To pass out those impossible knots that require careful detangling, my interest in performance requires me to tread a fine line between criticism and imagination. Maintaining, maintaining an objective eye to the body while accommodating space for the kind of naivete required of an artist to explore fl freely without the fear of a watchful eye. Writing a script need not be in conflict with critical reflection. It becomes an exercise in articulating the subtleties of lived experience and actively reining back overt explication. This understanding feeds back into critical writing, where the eye gravitates towards those urgencies that carry political precarity. In these currents, the body is not only occupying subversive spaces, but also attempting to find a language that allows it to cohabit with thought. This is where text could intervene as a means of record, process, and archive. Writing could then be a mode of repair, a way of recalibrating binaries and rendering rigid borders permeable to corruption. Maybe the only way ahead is to contaminate. Um, thank you, Najreen, for those words. And um, again, I think so much for us to come back to. Najreen will be with us to answer any questions that the audience may have. Also, the other panelists, uh, if you have any questions for Najreen, we can engage in a discussion with her in the Q&A. Um, now I want to invite Malika to talk about um, her work. So, uh, good evening, everyone. And as Pramoda mentioned, I will be presenting on behalf of Shane Jati Mukherjee, the Associate Editor at uh, Alternative South Asia Photography. So, um, unfortunately, she is not able to be here today um, due to unforeseen circumstances. And a part of Shane Jati's original presentation was um, on her work at ASAP Art, which curates critical writing on lens space practices in uh, South Asia. So for the last year, I have been working with Changeati as the copy editor at ASAP Art and as, as part of the editorial team. Uh, so I will be stepping in to speak about ASAP as a platform for image and text in the expanded field, since I cannot speak about Changeati's personal journey as a writer and editor. Um, before I begin, I would quickly like to thank Sabi, the Ishara Art Foundation, the India Art Fair, and Shivnada University for giving us an opportunity to speak about the work that ASAP has been doing. So ASAP Art was launched as part of ASAP Connect in February 2021 by founding editor Rahab Alana and associate editor Shenjati Mukherjee with the support of the Muti Nayak Foundation. Envisioned as an editorially driven app, the intent was and continues to be to create public engagement on the interdisciplinary nature and the socio-political dimensions of visual cultures in the subcontinent. So in Shenjati's own words, uh, and I quote, in my editorial work at ASAP, I've tried to engage with analytical strategies that move beyond the visual to consider the cultural and political work of photography. While the photographic histories and contemporary practices of South Asia uh, remain fairly unexplored within art historical studies, visual art and photography do intersect in many ways. I attempt to emphasize their relevance within and beyond the medium's close intimacy with cinema. Besides chronological and descriptive histories, I hope to build a knowledge resource that moves across disciplinary boundaries um, 
and probes complex networks and experiences um, that make up the photographic object and the material and consumer cultures related to it. So ASAP art is thus imagined as an inclusive, accessible community that provokes conversations and dialogues about what South Asia is, means, and can be for all of us. So um, since the, we have a stipulated time for the presentation, I will simply be introducing you to the platform and opening out the ways in which its various contributors have used text and image to engage with and reflect on the reality around us. So when we launched the app, uh, initially we hosted four lead categories of posts, which is stories, events, grants, albums, and then later we added podcasts as well. So these were created as a way to share information in a functional manner, driven by a user-friendly interface, um, and also represents the range of themes and formats that we have consistently been interacting with. So stories mainly consist of short reflective articles about publications, archives, histories, and contemporary cultures of lens-based art and media. Events comprises of reviews and considerations of current and past exhibitions, seminars, and festivals. We also have grants, which relates to those bodies of work that have been commissioned or are supported by institutions and individuals. An album provides a visual experience of the specific urs, as well as a series of curated assemblages of images. So another feature that we also have is this, uh, that of live streaming, uh, which allows us to uh, initiate conversations with people in the field of art, as well as artist walkthroughs, as a way of interacting with contemporary art practices and events across the region. So for instance, we have, um, I'll show a short clip from the exhibition where the birds never sing. This is an image of the people like were the teachers of Morichapi school. It's a school made by the refugee, uh, Bangladeshi, like lower caste refugees. So I started looking for him and then finally found him in 2019 in a remote island in Madhya Pradesh, uh, Malkangiri district. So the idea is really to uh, create dialogues and conversations and a short read articles that are delivered on a daily basis, ASAP affords a way for art and thinking about art to enter the space of the everyday. So within six months of uh, the app going live, we launched our affiliated website on World Photography Day. And this has essentially been imagined as an archive with all of our posts being available uh, over here. So you get a sense of the kind of different stories, events, and uh, context that our writers are exploring. Every time you want to read an essay um, in the book itself, you have to disassemble it. You have to open it up and then there are seven parts and then you have to assemble it back again. So as I mentioned, we also added a host of new features, which includes uh, the category of podcasts. And through this, our contributors engage in conversations with art practitioners, curators, and academics from across South Asia. So we'll just play a short clip from a conversation with Ivan Sundaram to illustrate the kinds of conversations we've been initiating. There are many you know, art organizations that have sprung up. And uh, so what could we do that would be a little different? And because of all the trustees, in other places also, many artists have been trustees. But because of the cross-disciplinary aspect of our trustees, both creative and intellectual, it then, you know, projects an image that, yes, this from theatre to film, to visual arts to politics, you know, that spectrum is what ideologically we will slowly, you know, emerge as, as having... A direction, say, in some way. 
So we've foregrounded the different concerns that drive the writer's work and engagement. And these have been organized according to theme and media quite organically. So for instance, we have architecture, which includes diverse approaches from writers reflecting on personal architectural practices through photography across different landscapes to colonial representations and uh, practices of architecture and what those might mean as symbols that were circulated. Um, Another entry to the field is thinking about the archive and collection and how uh, we can even think through the meaning of the term archive, apart from exploring different kinds of archival collections. Having worked with a lot of archives, I often, I always want to insist on that sense that archives are, are extremely concrete material assemblages as well as very much communities of people and that really inflects how each particular archive survives or doesn't survive um, not only its material reality and its particular material assemblage and that you know how fragile or not fragile those particular materials might be but also you know how tenacious that particular community is um, in its attachment to those materials and its desire to preserve them. We having work. So another urgency is that of ecology, where our writers have looked at the ways in which image makers have been addressing questions of sustainability and reflecting on the relationship between living organisms and their physical environment. Um, we also have writers who foreground questions of representation, performativity with regard to gender in both contemporary practices and uh, histories of image making. Um, the platform also excavates the often invisibilized histories of work and labor and explores questions of livelihood as well. Another thematic concern that has emerged is that of personal narratives, which focuses on how artists communicate their personal relationship to the world through their ways of seeing. And some of the essays and interviews also reflect on vernacular photographic practices and the personal archives of amateur photographers unraveling lost histories. Resistance is also something that has emerged as an ethical concern and brings to the fore modes, of culture, uh, modes and cultures of protest seeking a subversion of dominant narratives. Uh, we also have uh, speculative fiction, which collates visions of imagined futures as artists deploy fiction as a tool to speak about the present, as well as reclaim uh, histories and space. And I'll just play a short clip about the kinds of conversations that we've been having. Gives us tangible outcomes, I think, whereas science fiction always pushes us to imagine further. Indigeneity and science fiction was always with me, but it's only in recent four or five years I've been able to uh, merge uh, those two into my practice under this framework uh, I call Adivasi Futurism. Gives us tangible... So all of these are often interrelated. And I think that's what is also so exciting about this platform is because it, it is through these linkages that new constellations of meaning and dialogues around these concerns can emerge. So these represent broadly the parameters of our research led engagement with both archival and contemporary practices across various mediums. So media forms and medium specificity then becomes another way of entering this platform and interacting with it. We have posts that reflect on analog practices, on new media, as well as publications, installation art, and moving images and film. The purpose of talking about ASAP in the context of this panel is perhaps to provide a case study in the informative and interpretive writing around art through a freely accessible platform like a mobile application or a website. By placing image and text together through a curated sensibility, we hope to enable new ways of seeing that allow us as viewers and readers of these images to pause, think, and question the context in which they are created, circulated, and received. Um, so we currently have almost 300 posts, and the hope is to continue to build and expand ASAP, not only in terms of its participation base, but also work towards a multilingual platform. We currently do have a few posts in vernacular languages, and this is something that we hope to facilitate further as we draw on writers' experiences from across the region and beyond it to unpack what a South Asian imaginary can be. 
So before I end, I would quickly, uh, I will also be adding the link to the app in the chat box for those of you who would like to download it. And um, I would also like to thank Prabhakar Duara, who handles the social media for ASAP for helping me put this presentation together. And of course, to Shainjati Mukherjee for her support and feedback. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Malika. Um, and it's, it's amazing to see how the platform has come together and um, talk about these different types of uh, lens-based practices. Um, I'll start with a few questions that I have for some of you. Um, first question is to, is to Arushi, actually. Arushi, I think you work with so many genres across um, fiction, nonfiction, um, critical writing, perhaps a bit of dabbling a bit in research-based academic writing. Can you tell me how you grapple with these um, ideas of genre? And do you feel limited or do you feel like, do you feel freedom in the way you work? Um, thank you for that question, Pramoda. Um, I think I'd like to echo something that Tlana had brought up in his presentation. That it's a really wonderful time to be writing because there's so many platforms and initiatives that have been shaped by writers themselves, uh, people who understand um, the process of writing, its, its joys and pains, um, and people who come from a place of loving the practice of producing criticism in various sort of formats. So a lot more, particularly say a platform that we have um, being represented on this panel, Malika is uh, here on behalf of ASAP Art for which I've written. Um, just, the, just the ability to move with a lot of fluidity between an oral, oral medium where it's, it's a dialogue or a conversation versus a third person standard academic writing versus a review uh, or a photo album where you have the ability to come up with captions. The fact that we're provided that agility um, within the space of a platform uh, shows to us that more and more spaces for writing and more discursive spaces are opening themselves to cross-genre pollinations um, where you where, the idea of a genre is meant more as a as a as, as a convention that guides and instructs and informs, but not something that necessarily binds. Um, so it's, it's something to learn from, um, to deploy when it is useful, but to not feel constrained by. Uh, most of the editors that I've been working with um, have been very open to the possibility of bringing in fiction or poetry. Um, as modes of, of developing criticism. Um, and just a sort of quick note to thank people who are supporting independent publishing. Uh, I know we've had a panel on that in the symposium and there's so many publication houses. I, I mentioned Yogesh Metra, who's running uh, Panther's Paw, which is also an independent publishing house. Um, it's, it's so wonderful to have people take on these initiatives because they help writers experiment and innovate and grow beyond the confines of peer-reviewed journals and academic spaces which follow very strict conventions. Um, and I think a, a, a diverse ecosystem requires all of these various spaces to exist. You require as much a peer-reviewed journal which follows a certain process versus spaces that are a lot more agile and quick in their response to events that unfold. And as a writer, you too can then, you don't have to necessarily just practice a certain mode of thinking and writing. You can embody each of these in various durations. Thank you, Arushi. I can, I can very much relate to that myself. I remember writing my undergraduate dissertation and I refused to use the word I or the first person perspective anywhere. And my supervisor told me, why can't you just use I and just write in the first person perspective? I told her, but I didn't know that was a possibility for all these four years when I was at university. And um, 
then i think over the years it has changed but it's still sometimes very difficult to go beyond those conventions and i'm so glad um that you brought up how genre can be a direction a guiding principle and perhaps nothing beyond that um thank you so i think my next question is for tana tana you spoke about specifically your location in mizoram and also the role the vernacular plays in your text can you tell us a little bit about um vernacular and um you also explain struggles about about lacking vocabularies lacking uh, terminology perhaps can you tell us a little bit about how you overcome these challenges when you write um that's <laughs> that's a very interesting and also a very difficult question to answer um i think um instead of you know i mean it's not so much more on overcoming but also to find alternate ways of you know dealing with the difficulty of translation um and again um uh, especially in the context of uh, mizoram and not is i think uh, uh what is really uh, difficult is also on the question of um of language and how yeah uh, existing terminologies uh is not necessarily um compatible with uh, languages Uh, that are specific to a culture or a region so uh how does one um write and um i i guess uh, one of the ways in which you know and i also talked about this in my presentation um to to be writing uh in in the expanded field sort of uh, allows me to uh, move away from that you know constrictions and to uh, sort of invent uh, new languages that is not necessarily uh, in line with uh, existing uh, categories and nomenclatures i guess um there's this one very interesting um thing uh barafel from uh, mekalaya who is also uh, a writer on art uh, who is also uh, inventing new language and new uh, new words new vocabularies for you know um uh kasi language uh, specifically on art so i think there are ways in which we can sort of navigate and find new ways of uh, dealing with this uh, problem um but of course this is quite uh an arduous task that needs to be um addressed and of course that needs more work and more yeah thank you tlana um i think um this is perhaps a problem a lot of us who write in vernacular languages constantly face um especially in the in languages i mean even in sinhala in sri lanka we constantly face this problem where we have to come up with new terminology and it's also very difficult because we don't have um it's it's very difficult to have it, that means we have to start conversations and build discourses um uh, because words can't just be invented um and thank you and i think particularly in the in your context also it's very it's very, it's, it's 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 very interesting to hear that the expanded field has offered you that freedom um to experiment with words in various languages um moving on to nazreen i hope i was able to do justice to your presentation sorry if i was rushing no no um, you did thank you thank you so much for reading my presentation now couldn't have <laughs> uh, no myself tonight so i think one of the ideas you are you are really focused on is of course archives performance and also the role writing plays in it and sometimes i feel like conventionally these, these three could be viewed as so things that are so far away from each other 
and how do you bring these things i think you explain how you be, do, how you bring these these three things together in your presentation but also i think moving moving forward what are some of the objectives when working in archives performance and also building writing around those ideas right i think a lot of my interest in cinema photography um archives performance i mean they are informed by my training in in the in in uh, at the school of arts and aesthetics where i was introduced uh, to these different streams um by way of the the their intersections and i think um that is an impulse of carried forward in my work um uh, going forward i think um i'm trying to find a language um that will that can kind of um allow me to talk about archives and performance in the same breath um i don't have a name for that language yet but i'm hoping to arrive at some form of expression that will allow me to write um about performance about cinema about photography um in a way that does not really mark that discipline as something that is vastly at a remove from another discipline so um uh like in in writing like so so when i was writing the script that i talked about what's in the name like a lot of the content in that particular script was informed by my critical reflections by the way i thought about certain things so it's not like these these um impulses of you know removed from each other anyway i think it, it's it's a matter of arriving at a certain um language that uh, will help me to like cohabit these spaces um without worrying about whether um, i'm straying too far away um from my original impulse so i think that still there, there's a lot of work to be done there still but i'm hoping that my interest in performance practice my interest in archives uh do can can coexist on the same plane at some um, some day because i think um my interests are quite um, interdisciplinary and uh, and i think i would like that like it to remain that way i don't think i can i can really float on one particular discipline i think i need to be in like living in that intersection in order to be able to uh, cultivate my interest uh, in performance arts yeah i think many of us can relate to that where our interests are so vast and so exciting and we want to inhabit interdisciplinary spaces and i think arushi you had a question for malika in particular about um some of the labor that is invisibilized in the process of maintaining a platform editing um yeah yeah pramoda i thank you for bringing that up because i'm so glad that malika mentioned the team uh behind the asap um and to just sort of talk about i think we have a question in the q and a box as well which is on which does have to do with how we um uh, with the question of writing as labor as as a job as something that must uh, support livelihood and generate livelihood for writers um to just um since malika has also worked on a lot of the essays that i've written for asap i sort of wanted to ask her about her experience with copy editing um and the sort of situatedness of all these allied things that are required for the production of writing which is copy editing which is proofing um in the case of web platforms uploading and sort of um its digital production in the form of a web page um so that was something that i was curious to hear malika's thoughts on uh thank you arushi and pramoda and uh thank you for also bringing this question of the invisibilization of labor up and i'd like to take that uh as an opportunity to again shout out to the team at asap which is shinjati and rahab as the associate editor and founding editor respectively and gulmehar who handles the back end as well as prabhakar who handles the social media and rajneesh who uh, handles the website and the design of the platform um i have been working with asap since its inception so i think for me it's interesting because i like to think of myself as the first reader 
to all of the posts after they've come from we change these inputs with the writers working on it over several drafts so i think there's a certain pride in looking at the way in which all of us contribute in whatever small way to the final product and of course i mean the fact that i am also able to speak at this platform today shows the support that i do receive from asap and from change it especially as um, the copy editor and as a person whose voice is being heard um in such a place and i think with any collaborative um medium there is a way in which of course um different parts of the process may be invisibilized but i think ultimately if there is some recognition of that or uh, maybe that's a work uh, or a work in progress or a step towards allowing for all labor to be recognized in this way so thank you for that question and i hope that we can continue to have these conversations definitely thank you malika um we also have a question in the uh, q and a if one of you can address it i would be really happy um as art writers how do you get funding and ensure that it sustains your life and writing i can see many of us smiling but yeah does anyone want to address that um um i could go first if uh, i have a day job because unfortunately i don't believe writing assignments pay um in a way that can support a life um any mode of living independently uh so when you have expenses such as rent uh basic utilities that should be public but are private um including something as simple as clean air in the city where i live uh or purified municipal water um these expenses add up and unfortunately writing assignments at the moment do not across the board compensate adequately to meet those uh needs um having said that there are of course institutions that pay well but um writing can often be a slow and laborious process especially long form essays uh pieces of critical writing academic essays that go through a certain process which can span a couple of months uh publications print publications take a while so as a writer uh one of the things that i have done is always held a day job um i know there are writers here on this panel who don't have day jobs or do full time writing independently uh i've been very lucky in uh, i work as an editorial manager at serendipity arts foundation and there has been a lot of support and camaraderie from my colleagues in terms of just their enthusiasm for my writing um and there has been a lot of work life balance that allows one to pursue independent writing inquiries uh but that is that is just currently the thing I, just to flag so far i haven't yet managed to make livelihood from writing that could support independent living um and so that's that's certainly a, a an area of concern thank you arushi maybe najreen as yes. someone who is doing independent writing yeah uh i have been uh, writing in an independent capacity for the last two and a half years before that i had a day job as well but then i soon realized that um i need a lot of time like arushi mentioned uh, writing can be a very laborious process and takes up a lot of your head space as well uh so uh, um working alongside pursuing writing did not really work for me so i had to let go of my job in order to concentrate on writing because that is something i really wanted to like very dedicatedly take on um but that also meant that i was letting go of letting go of, of a certain degree of financial security and um when you want to start worrying about rent um and 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 other practical areas it can also weigh down on you and take up a lot of your head space which you had originally demarcated for writing so it's it, it, so these problems kind of feed feed back into each other uh at the moment um because of the pandemic uh i'm not living in the city of delhi which is saving me a lot uh, 
uh, of money in terms of rent. But um, I would say that it is very difficult to make a living as an independent writer. Uh, it is very important for institutions that hire you um, to be um, receptive of the of, of the amount of time that you would probably take um, to to arrive at, at, at a particular text to be receptive of you as a person and, um, and uh, to be receptive of uh, of of everything you bring to the table um, as, as as a writer and not just you know in terms of the job that they have hired you for so i think um in the larger context it's really important for institutions first of all to be mindful of these things and secondly um on a personal note to also kind of um uh, you know chart out which projects um interest you and not to kind of um take on more than you can probably handle because I have been at that stage where I took on a lot of writing projects and not necessarily only those that interested me and that can also drain you quite a bit because uh, writing is ultimately at the end of the day a very personal um, process and um, I think at this point I only take up those writing projects that really interest me and I've been very fortunate to be uh, to have worked with a couple of institutions and editors who have been extremely helpful generous and uh, um, have helped me navigate my own processes um, and uh, just generally made for really good company. Um, and I think that kind of um, solidarity and a sense of community in the writing uh, world is really important because as writers, you also tend to be <laughs> you, you, like really like you work um on your own time most like, mostly right so as as writers it's also important to be part of communities like that um uh, just to feel nurtured if not anything else um and i've been really lucky to have had company like that um over the last couple of years uh but yeah i i think um the contingencies are all are still not completely in my favor. So I think as an independent writer, I have a lot more work to do here um, in figuring out what works for me and what doesn't. Um, and I think that, I'll, when, I mean, given the current situation, I think it just means um, looking for uh, the right bodies to work with. Thank you so much, Nazreen. I think it's the choices that we decide to make also on the way, the projects that we do, the time we spend, um, all of that. Um, thank you so much. I think I'm. We are very much over time, uh, so I'm going to hand over to Savi for uh, concluding remarks for the symposium. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pramoda. Hello. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello. Thank you, Pramota. I have to say the past two days have been extraordinarily rich and thoughtful, and the symposium somehow felt like a space where we witnessed such care among all the participants towards one another and towards each other's practices and thoughts. And at the same time, it also felt like an autopsy of art institutions. Um, Asma, in her closing remarks, put this aptly, pointing out that we may be seeing artists, curators, and writers redefining art, but the question also comes back to institutions and what artists expect from institutions. Last year with the pandemic, I remember Rox Media Collective posing a thought that we've seen immense resilience and ingenuity from artists. I might be paraphrasing, getting it a little uh, off, but they were basically pointing out to it being the institution's turn now to show that resilience and ingenuity. And these two days were only a glimpse of a very wide pulsating field that, that, you, that is carrying with it a high level of agility and ingenuity going, that goes into self-organizing, intervening, creating and sustaining practice and sustaining all the political urgencies that inspire uh, all of these practitioners. Uh, we could see in these two days that the division of roles between artists, curators, writers, publishers, editors, was less dominant, it was not the division, and instead we were witnessing complex entanglements between each of them and each of the roles, and with the sites of production and encountering contemporary art. And this poses serious questions to the role of institutions such as museums, academies, archives, art fairs, and art spaces um, generally. 
As I was a bit busy with logistics for each of the panels, I'm going to have to go over my notes and recordings all over again. So in conclusion, I'd just like to extend gratitude to a number of people that made this symposium possible. Firstly, a big thank you to all the speakers and moderators of the symposium. It was really a privilege to work with you, to listen to such thoughtful conversations and presentations, and to also attend some of your rehearsals and preparatory meetings, which were just as rich. From the India Art Fair, I want to thank Jaya Sokan, Uma Jacob, Gautami Reddy, Joshua, and Manav Jalan, who strangely seems to appear 15 times among the attendees because apparently he gave his link to many other friends and his contacts. And so many others on the India Art Fair team, you all have been such generous partners and hosts to this program. To Shivnada University and Premjish Achari, thank you for your support. From the Ishara team, I want to thank my colleagues Himanshu Kadam, Nadine Khalil, Flavia D'Souza, Neha Khan, and our chairperson Smita Prabhakar, whose support has made Ashara possible, and with whom my colleagues and I share great enthusiasm in everything that we're doing. Several friends were also reached out to in brainstorming for this symposium, and I want to thank them all. You hopefully know who you are, and especially to two friends, Vidya Shivdas and Saira Ansari, from whom I got quite a lot of constructive feedback. And last but not the least, a big thank you to all the attendees. I think uh, by now, with the kinds of discussions we're having, it doesn't make sense to say someone is an audience and someone is a, is a producer of content or a, or a speaker. It's in fact, we're all participants now and the questions raised here come back to all of us um, in different ways. So thank you all. I hope this continues our conversations. Do log in to the recordings in case you miss some of the sessions. Um, some very illuminating thoughts have been shared. A lot of the speakers shared links. We hope to consolidate those links um, on the Shara and India Art Fair websites. We also hope that during the physical iteration of the fair, we'll get to do some programming. And finally, over the summer, we launch an online platform that uh, will bring together even more references, even more uh, kinds of interventions and mobilizations that are happening in the field and that we can map them somehow. So on that note, thank you very much and let's hope we can all be safe and things go forward well. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.